I'm excited. I know I sound like it, huh? I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited. You guys remember that guy, Ben Stein? Wow. I'm so excited, and I just can't hide it. I'm about to lose control, and I think I like it. No. I am actually excited. I just, I'm just making jokes. This uh, is my favorite season of the year. It's also the hardest season of the year, just because of the ones that we love who are no longer with us. And, and I, I wanted to bring that up from the get-go because there are many people who are encouraging one another to celebrate. We, we put out our decorations and we want to be happy, and, and we should. Right? I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't, but we, we sometimes forget that there's a lot of pain that comes with the joy. Why? Because there are those whom we miss. What I love about the Word of God and the Gospel of Christ, of His advent, of Him coming, is that Christ did not come into a perfect world. He didn't come at a perfect time. He didn't come to perfect people. He did not come when all things were going well. Yet he came. He showed up. I wanted to share real briefly, I won't go into great detail, but I had an opportunity to share my testimony and share a little bit of the gospel with a young lady, college-age young lady, and I remember talking to her and sharing all the blessings that God had given to me in my life, and she had questions, and uh, to make a long story short, after I'd spoken with her, some of the questions that she had really um, made it hard, because I got to thinking about how I presented the gospel to her, and I spoke of the blessings of restoration and how God had blessed me and my family, and I had my wife and my daughter and my home and my family, and all these things and the questions she has, well, what about those who just lost their families? What about those who are at war? What about those who... And I realized, realized the mistake that I had made is that I, I was attributing all my blessings and all the good things in my life as some evidence that God was present. Now, there's nothing wrong with counting your blessings. There's nothing wrong with being grateful and thankful, and we should acknowledge where our blessings come from. In this season of Advent, today we speak of peace. It's been said that peace is not the absence of war or absence of conflict, but it is the presence of God. I'm reminded of a painting, a painting that I just described for you quickly. You've probably heard this before. I've described it many times. I saw this painting once, and it was called Peace, and in this painting was this great tree that had fallen into a river, and the river was raging, and in the background there was a barn on fire, and there was a storm going, and there was lightning in the background, and, and there was all these things, the raging rapids, and the, the rocks were really jagged that were sticking out of the river, and there was animals fleeing into the backwoods, and the, the painting was entitled Peace, and and as I was looking at it, my eyes were drawn towards the center bottom, which there was a little branch, where, and the branch was being held out at the bottom of the painting. And in the branch, there was a nest, and little baby birds in the nest, and the mother bird covering those baby birds with her wings. And the artist had entitled the painting, Peace. How can we have peace? As I read from the scriptures, I, I pray that the word of God and his promise of his presence would give you peace. I found that in my own life, it's not been my blessings and my family and those who've surrounded me 
the material things or my home or even my path or the plan that God had for me that gave me peace. It was knowing that God was with me through all of it. This is the promise of Advent, that he's come to be with us and that we are with him. Let me read there, I'm starting in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, he was found, or she was found, with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she, shall bring, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophets, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. This is God's word. And may the Lord God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Will you pray again with me? Father, I thank you for this short passage, and I pray, Lord, you empower me by your Holy Spirit to speak words that are piercing, strong, and full of fire. Set our hearts in fire to remember that your presence is with us, that you are enough. Yes. You are enough. I thank you for this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Notice there, in verse 18, Mary was betrothed to Joseph. She's engaged. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. The context of the prophecy of the Christ coming, of him being born, that Emmanuel, God with us, was on the way, happened to a couple, and this couple were not yet married. Mary receives this promise, uh, a Joseph receives this promise, and they're a couple that's about to break up. See, we, we, we recognize when blessings come, when we pray and, and God answers us, we scream, hallelujah, thank you, Lord, praise you, Lord, thank you for answering our prayers, but do we remember that Jesus is with us when relationships are on the rocks. This is the kind of situation Jesus puts himself into. Knowing, now, he wasn't surprised that Joseph was gonna feel this way. He wasn't surprised, he sends an angel, while he's, think, he's thinking about divorcing her, they're not even married yet, he's thinking about canceling the engagement. That's what it means to put her away. He was going to cancel the engagement and not marry her. And he thought about these things, and behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. He's reminded of God's Spirit. Every time I look in Scripture and I think of the Holy Spirit and I see the phrase Holy Spirit, I think of God with us. I think of God's very presence with us. Because the way the Holy Spirit is spoken about in the New Testament, he's never far away. The Holy Spirit is not spoken about as being somewhere else. The Holy Spirit always in the New Testament is spoken, spoken about living with us, being in us. He's thinking, Joseph is thinking about severing and dividing from a relationship which is important to him. And he's told the Holy Spirit is with Mary. This child that is going to be born came from the very presence of God. 
shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That even his purpose of why he's coming is to save the people from their sins. Notice that he's not called Jesus because he's come to bless his people for all the things they've done right. It doesn't say, you call him Jesus because he's going to give them the answers to their prayers. He doesn't say, you call his name Jesus because he'll commend them for their righteousness. It says, no, you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. The, the, the presence of the Lord, his desire is to come right into our mess and save us. This is good news. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophets saying, behold, the virgin shall be with child. The inexperienced, the one who has not done this before, has no idea how to handle it. She's going to be with child. Now, she might have heard. She might have saw family. She had cousins, right? And we know at least one that's mentioned, Elizabeth. She's got friends. She's got family. Her herself was a child. So she's had some experience secondhand of what it means to carry a child. But she is a virgin, has not even had relationship with a man. Inexperienced, not knowing, not having the training. She'll bear a son. She's going to do something she's never done before. Something she's not ready for, something she's not experienced, she's going to do. And they... He didn't say you, they. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. That God is going to be with the one who doesn't know what they're doing, has never done this before. God is with her. God is with you. We can all relate to this. You know, I, learn, I like learning new things. I'm a very curious mind. It's hard for me to sit still. I'm always getting into things I shouldn't get into, and I'm always messing with things I shouldn't mess with. I take, part, I take apart things I probably shouldn't take apart just to see how they work. You know what I've found? The more and more I learn new skills, is like everything is hard until you learn how to do it. Like once you learn how to do it and do it right, it, it comes naturally. It's, it's a lot easier. It doesn't make it easy, but it's a lot easier. I believe with all my heart that God, God's way of training us, God's way of strengthening us, God's way of giving us experience is always accompanied by the promise of his presence. That every situation you're going to go into in your life, everything that's hard that you're going to have to deal with, everything that's terrible that you're facing right now. I know some of us right now are looking into the future and there are some things that you're not looking forward to going through. And I'm here to tell you God is with you. The word of God promises that I will not leave you nor forsake you. Never, never, ever. He's with you. I want to read a few promises from the Old Testament, a few times where the Lord spoke. I find it so interesting that when you go through the Bible, when God calls a person, when God says, I'm going to show up and I'm going to do something for my people, I'm going to do a work in your life, every time someone questioned it, every time someone was hesitant, every time someone tried to argue with the Lord and said they couldn't do it, his answer was never, you can. It was never, you're able He always answered them, you can and you're able because I will be with you. I will be with you. Look what God told Isaac. We're going all the way back to the beginning in Genesis 26. I'm going to move swiftly through here, so if you're taking notes, take them quickly. There was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. He's fearing famine. He's worried about the future. 
And God says, don't go to the place that's obvious. <laughs> he says, dwell in this land where the famine is. And I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants, I give all these lands and I will perform the oath which I swore to, your, to Abraham, your father. Do what I commanded, excuse me. He basically tells him, do what I commanded your father before you and I will bless you like I blessed him. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. Look what, he's, look what he said to Joshua, Joshua 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of a good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you, Emmanuel. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You can obey my word. You can be strong. You can have good courage. You don't have to fear. You don't have to worry. Why? Because I am with you. Do we have any English teachers in here? Okay. Okay. Oh, I might get this a little bit wrong, so I was, I was looking for some help. But we have four, that word for. Look there. Right there. For the Lord your God is with you. So be strong and of a good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For. Because. That's a, that's a word you could replace. Because the Lord your God is with you. This is the reason you can be strong. Not because you're strong, because strong is the Lord who is with you. You can have a good courage, not because you're courageous, because the Lord your God is with you. Do not be afraid, not because there's nothing to fear, but because perfect love, the Lord God who is with you, casts out all fear. For the Lord your God is with you. Because, for this reason... We can be strong. We don't have to fear. I'm convinced of that. We don't have to fear. Look what the Lord said to Gideon. So Gideon said to him, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Remember Gideon? Gideon's called. Many people have taken Gideon's story, this is a side note, have taken Gideon's story and they take little portions of Gideon's story and they try to make spiritual principles out of little things. Gideon puts out a fleece. And people think, well, if you, if you kind of put a test out there for God to make sure it's him, then God will confirm it to you. That's not what the story is about. You read the entire story of Gideon. The story of Gideon isn't about Gideon. It's about a loving God who tries to convince a doubter over and over and over and over again. That's the story of Gideon. As a man who didn't believe who he was. Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my father's house. Talk about self-esteem issues. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Listen, it don't matter how weak your family is. It doesn't matter what your kinfolk say about you. I know some of us experienced some of that kinfolk love not too recently. <laughs> we, we had a, 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 little, a little Thanksgiving dinner maybe. Maybe you saw that uncle or that cousin. I just You want to love them. You want to love them. But you also kind of want to... you would be like, you're lucky I'm a Christian. Right? Oh, no. Act like your family's perfect. Okay, I'm not talking to you then. All right, I'm not talking to you then. But for those of you who got a regular family <laughs> that causes these issues, listen, it doesn't matter what your kinfolks say about you. It doesn't matter if they believe in you. And it doesn't matter even of what you think of yourself. When it concerns God's presence, his presence is enough for you. His presence is enough for you. He made you with a plan and a purpose. He's given you his spirit and his word. He will carry you along. 
Surely, I love that. Surely, I will be with you. For certain, I will be with you. Not maybe, not kinda, but surely, firmly, truly, I will be with you. The prophet has written, Isaiah 43, But now thus saith the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name, you are mine. I love that. You belong to him. You belong to him. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. For, because I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. This prophecy, this idea of him sacrificing a person for your life, he's speaking of what he's going to do himself. He says, I am your savior. Isn't it interesting? He says, I'll give men for you and people for your life. And then he comes in the person of Jesus Christ and gives his life for our life. Fear not, for I am with you. This promise, his presence, is enough. Jesus is with you when your family is splitting up. Jesus is with you. Maybe someone that you've known for a while has told you they're going to leave you. His presence is enough. Maybe you're getting ready to go into a situation you've never been in before, you've not trained for, and you're a virgin, so to speak. Emmanuel. God is with us. I count my blessings, and I pray that you do too. I'm very thankful for them. But I have to say, the blessings aren't enough. Because the blessings can be taken away. You having a great family that surrounds you and supports you, that's not enough. You need to know this. Because there are many right now that have put their faith in God. Things are going great. I'm blessed. I got my family. I got my friends. I got my wife. I got my husband. I got my house. I got this. As soon as all that's taken away, what are you left with? I see the irony that, that in our entertainment, it's so wild. I was watching a newscast about air raid sirens going on in Ukraine, and then immediately an Applebee's commercial, eating good in the neighborhood, while I just got done watching a neighborhood that had been turned to rubble. And we sit over here because it's not happening to us, and God is good. Oh, yeah, God is good. What if your business was leveled to the ground by bombs? Your family taken away in war? Would you still sing those praises? That's the true test. Is his presence really enough when all your blessings are gone? That's a, this is gut check time, church. You know the secret? The secret of true, powerful praise and worship, the kind of worship that tears down walls and moves mountains, you know what the secret is to true praise and worship? It's when the heart worships God anyway. When things are going rough, you worship him. When things are hard, you worship him. When everything you love and everything that you, that you care for is taken away and your heart still cries out, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He 
He demonstrates his love in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, there are many sins that I myself struggle with that I've, asked to ask, I've had to ask for mercy for. And the one I'm ashamed of most is worshiping the things that came from his hand rather than worshiping the one who gave them. Sometimes we're so grateful for our blessings that we forget to bless the name of the one who gave us those blessings. The secret, the truth is found in worshiping the Lord for who he is, who he really is, not what he's given, not what he's done for me. What, if the Lord never did another thing for me the rest of my life, he's still worthy of my worship. If the Lord allowed you to be cursed and everything taken away for the rest of your life and everything was removed from you in this earth, he remains good. Do you know that? His goodness, his greatness is not based on how well our lives go. His nature is good. His character is good and holy, and he never changes. And his presence with us is enough. Fear not, for I am with you. He's given us his word. His presence is enough. Jesus came and spoke to them. <laughs> There's a sermon right there. I if I didn't read another mumbling word... That would be enough right there. Jesus came and spoke to them. Period. The Lord showed up. That's what we mean by Advent. Do you know that? That he showed up. The advent of something is when something appears, when something comes, when something arrives. That's the advent. The first advent is what we celebrate is when that baby came, was born in a manger. He showed up. He arrived. Jesus came. And we sing. We sing praises about his first coming. And we warn people of his second advent. Do you know that's, that's what it is? When we say the second coming, it's his second advent, his appearing again. He's going to come back in judgment. And his people will sing praises and the unbelievers will lament and mourn. This is serious. Jesus came. He spoke to his disciples. He spoke to the nation. He spoke to the world. He arrived. His presence in this earth produced the greatest choir concert the world has ever seen. Listen, I, I married my wife, and in the Christmas season, in the Advent season of 2009, we got some tickets to go see Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Now, if you ever get a chance to go see Trans-Siberian Orchestra, go. It is a fantastic concert. They got lights and neon and, and flames, and the guitars sound amazing, and the, the orchestra is awesome. The singers and the choirs are so, just make you have goosebumps on you when you listen to it. But that pales in comparison to the choir of angels that showed up on that night. There were no superstars there. Those angels gathered in the heavens and performed a concert and sang glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men, they sang they weren't selling box seats. There was no red carpet rolled out. It was a bunch of shepherds in the first family. That's it. The greatest choir concert in the world in history was put on for a handful of people. I imagine that the music that comes from heaven and the way those angels sang that we have not touched 
even just a, a small minuscule piece of what that sounds like on earth. All our music, all our singing, all our instrument playing, everything on earth is nothing compared to this choir of angels. They sang for his arrival. You know why I think that a whole bunch of people didn't get invited? Because those angels weren't singing but for an audience of one. It was the Lord that they were singing for. It was for the one they loved, that loved them. An audience of one. The shepherds got lucky. <laughs> Even though I don't believe in luck, they just happened to be there. Hey, listen, I don't care if anybody gets offended or not. It doesn't matter to me whether you like the songs up here or not. Can I just be real? We're not singing for you. We're not worshiping you. <laughs> Sorry, let me move on. That was unnecessary. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He commands them to go. And he says, teaching them, teaching the, the disciples to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. I am with you always. Underline that, highlight that, remember that, memorize that. I am with you always even to the end of the age, even to the end of the world, even to your last breath. I think about Fanny Crosby, who was blind, wrote so many, so many beautiful, wonderful hymns. The Blessed Assurance, was that a Fanny Crosby one? I believe it was. Yeah, she wrote 4,000 hymns, Fanny Crosby, couldn't see. And a man, I believe it was a senator, her governor asked her about her sight, how she could worship a God that not allowed her to see the beauty of a sunset or the beauty of her family or a flower. She had not seen a single thing. And she said, I have an advantage over you, young man. When I open my eyes in eternity, the first thing I will see is his face. Oh, come, come, Emmanuel. If our people just knew that you were with us, I am with you always. The overcomer, the one who's finding victory in Christ is the one who knows that Christ is with them. The believer that has true joy Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Paul says, this is the hope of glory. Christ in you. That's the secret. It's Christ in you. The hope of glory. I am with you. I am living in you. Always. My spirit is with you. He said it so many ways. He says to his disciples in John 14, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer and the world sees me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Do you know this? Do you know that the that the Lord Jesus is in the Father? Do you know that Christ is in you? Do you know that you are in him? The scriptures say we are seated in him in the heavenly places. We are seated in Christ Jesus. That is our place spiritually. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. I'll reveal myself to you. If you have my words and obey them, if you believe what I've said, I'll show myself to you. 
Judas, not Iscariot, not that Judas, a different Judas, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest and reveal yourself to us and not to the world? That's an important question. What's going to make your revealing to us different from the rest of the world? Because he appeared in the world. He appeared to all kinds of unbelievers. It was the people that cried for him to be crucified. They saw him. This is an interesting question. How is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Why is it that we see Jesus and it seems like the world around us doesn't see him? We even use these words. They're blind to his presence. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. He will guard my word. He will hold it safe, close to him. Keep it, guard it. Also, obey. That word keep implies obedience to his word. Don't be just a hearer, but a doer. Anyone loves me, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He says, I'll reveal myself, I'll manifest myself to those who have my word and obey it. They're the ones who love me. He says, the ones who love me keep my word and my father loves them and we, me and the father will come and make our home with them. He, he's speaking of the presence. His presence in your life. Jesus says to the church, not to the unbelieving world, he's addressing the church in Revelation chapter three when he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Are you, are you an anyone? That's a silly question. Yes, the answer is yes. Have you heard his voice? Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Jesus said that he knocks at the door, and if you hear his voice and open the door, he will come into you. That's, that's the translation that we get. He will come into you. The question that's asked of the Corinthian church after Paul gets done correcting them, he says, do you know of your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you? I believe that's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm bad with addresses, so that might be wrong. It's towards the end. Do you know how that Jesus Christ is in you? Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? You've been bought with a price, therefore honor God with your spirit and with your body, which belong to God. His presence is enough. His presence is is enough. Do you know that Christ is with you? Do you know that Christ is with you? If you're not sure, I want to pray with you. If you're not sure, I want to talk to you and I want to show you his promises of, of how he promised to come. My desire is that, that not a single person ever leave when I'm preaching or if I'm sharing or teaching the word of God. I don't want ever, anyone to leave without God's presence. I want everyone to know that the Lord is with them. That really is my heart's desire. He is enough. Listen, I, I met him in a jailhouse. I didn't have everything taken from me. I threw it all away. And he was with me. And he showed me he was with me. Your life does not consist in the things that you possess. The goodness of God is not dependent on whether you have a blessed life or not. God is near, the scripture said, God is near to the downtrodden. 
Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. People like to correct me on that. They'll say, oh, it says blessed are the poor in spirit. In Matthew it does. Go read it in Luke. He says blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. It's not one or the other, it's both. Oh, there's many ways to have poverty. Wealth can be a number of things. You know, David was king. David was king when he wrote one of the Psalms and he begins that Psalm and he says, this poor man cried out to the Lord and he heard me. Is God near to you? Do you know his presence? Do you know his spirit? Does he speak to you? God's not quiet, but he does speak with a still, small voice, and he's often hard to hear. And I want to just give a quick word of encouragement and warning. Every little voice you hear doesn't mean it's from God. If you want to test whether or not you're hearing from his spirit, read the word, read scripture, what has been written. Thus saith the Lord, according to scripture. Then, then when he speaks to you, you'll recognize him. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice, and they follow me. My sheep know my voice. They know my presence, and they follow me. I give them eternal life and no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. He's that close. He's that close. He's holding you in his hand. Do you know that? Are you convinced? Are you fully assured of your place in Christ and how Christ is in you? I hope so. Will you stand with me for a word of prayer? Father God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this opportunity to preach your word. I thank you for the scripture that teaches us. I pray, Lord. Forgive me. I pray. I pray that you will show us mercy. Reveal yourself to us, Lord. Make us a people that are not hearers only, but doers of the word. Make us a people that guard and keep your word, that truly love you. Make your home with us. Come into our lives, Emmanuel. Reveal yourself in us, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning we're gonna sing a hymn. Uh, it's a Christmas hymn, but it is appropriate. This call for the Lord to come. Have you asked the Lord to come into your life? Have you invited the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ into your life? He wants to live with you, walk with you, and assure you of his presence. His scripture promises it. He wants to be close to the believer. He wants a relationship with you. This isn't some far off thing. This is some someone, this Lord, this creator, the Son of God, the Savior, literally wants to live in you and walk with you every day. Do you have that in your life? Do you know him like that? Are you walking with Jesus? Have you surrendered your life to him and received his Holy Spirit? If you have not, I invite you to come as we sing. We want to talk to you. We want to continue to encourage you. We want to pray with you. We want to talk to you about what it means to be saved. The scriptures talk about a first step you can take, and that step is baptism. To be baptized into Christ. The scripture says that all that who are baptized into Christ are baptized into his death. Just as he was raised from the dead, you are raised to live a new life. You are united with Christ in baptism. The water is ready. If you need to surrender your life to Christ, if you need to be baptized into Jesus Christ, come as we sing.